All right, so next we have our neighborhood food network call and we I think I saw our special guest Didi. Are you yeah. on with us. <clears throat> there you are Okay, can you unmute yourself Didi. Yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, and do you have her bio to introduce her Anne is our neighborhood food network manager now. So yes. Um, can you hear me. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay so. Um, she has a short medium and a long bio this woman is done quite a bit so let's, I'm going to go through, go through her short bio she is the author of ecology of care medicine agriculture money and the quiet power of human and microbial communities and understanding soil health and watershed function she teaches participatory workshops in both personal and online helping to show the nested relationships between soil health human health and water cycles and climate resiliency she is the founder of the Land and Leadership Initiative and the Center for Sustainable Medicine and a co-founder of the Can We Rehydrate California Initiative. She is an independent trainer and curriculum developer for the UNFAO Farmer Field School Program and the Andhra, hope I'm pronouncing this right, Pradesh <laughs> Community Managed Natural Farming Initiative in India. She was one of five speakers at the United Nations FAO World Soil Day in 2017. I mean, what she's doing right now is so, people are, need to be so educated on all this and it's so important. So thank you for being with us. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, do you have a particular format that you, I, I uh, well, you were going to talk about the importance of soil health. If you just yep. want to, if you do, do that, and, 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 and do you have a do you have a link that you can show, like her website? If you just a few things, well, because I don't have those, um, I'm not trapped with those. Yes, I will put those up, and I will also send, I'm also going to send everything out tomorrow. All these links that I just read, all this will okay. be great. Going out. Great, yeah, landandleadership.org and Lolly Lolly the L A L I dot teachable dot com is where. Um, I actually have a course that is starting February 20th, an online course. Oh, yeah, let's um, show that link. Yeah. Um, if you go to, let's see, I'll put it in here. You can Lolly. Land, at, land and leadership. That's the um, one. That, that's the main site, but the one I just put in, you might need to put a HTTPS in front of it or something like that. Okay, but I'll send that out to everybody you tomorrow can find as well. That. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, well, I just want to say also um, to to for in terms of what I was just listening to that this is a uh, this is a, a topic that's really important to me as well. I, I worked for um, over twenty years as a holistic healthcare provider, and um, and my book, The Ecology of Care, has a lot about. Uh, about the microbiome and its influence on um, mental health and uh, and how how the food that we eat. Um, let's see, I'm getting distracted by seeing my own website there. So sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll make this go away. Okay, keep going. Maybe we'll do that at the end. Uh, I'm like, oh, I gotta fix that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, so, um. Yeah, the, the, just the topic of, of um, public health and food, uh, particularly around issues of glyphosate and the microbiome um, is really, really near and dear to me. And it's becoming, it's becoming more and more personal. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, that I'm gonna put a video in the chat right now. And it's a woman named Catherine Reed and she's a researcher from the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. A short video so you don't have to spend your life watching it it's amazing her daughter had autism and she was determined as a researcher to fix it and she did everything that she could she eliminated all kinds of toxins she brought all organic food and yet her daughter still wouldn't quite come back to normal and this little girl you'll see in the video she had like five hours screaming fits yeah and when you see this little girl at the end of the video how normal she is. And the last thing Catherine took out of her daughter's diet was glutamate, which is hidden in our food supply mm -hmm. under four or five different names. So you just have to spend 16 minutes to watch this and you will be amazed. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. That's a wonderful resource. 
So we, we it really all comes back to the food, whether however the child got damaged, whether it was, you know, toxins from one source or another or genetic or whatever it was, when, it, when we go back to food and the food comes from the soil. So can you talk about soil yeah. health and yes, why I'm gonna... soil health is something that we really need to focus on and look at? So we're going to talk a little bit about um, healthy soil and a healthy planet in general, because I understand I was looking a little bit about it, the, your your work as a group, um, the whole neighborhood food network, which is super inspiring, and I would like to be involved in that as well. Right. Um, and um, uh, there's a there. There's something that I teach about called the soil sponge, which I think of as like the foundational aspect of so many of things, our human health, planetary health, um, our weather, our climate, et cetera. So, um, so maybe just throw into the chat quickly, we've been talking about some of them, but what are the effects you're already seeing of climate change, but also environmental de degradation, things that you're seeing in um, in the land, in children, et cetera, in your own bodies. And I will say that that uh, having studied all of this for quite a while uh, in a more non-traditional way, mm -hmm. uh, I have come to a very different view of how biology actually regulates the climate, which does include the carbon cycle, but it is so much more than that. Yeah. Warmer uh, weather, winter in Wisconsin, flooding and desertification, and even mass shootings. And I would agree that is connected because of the lack of minerals that's now in the food. Yep. Um, it, it's really depleting uh, the brain's ability to function and to make good, have good decision making. Yeah. Yes. And there's actually a huge correlation between mass shootings and um, antidepressants. Yes. Which, um, one of the main one of the main, uh, I can see I can I keep getting pulled back into my old healthcare role, but but <laughs> one of the main side effects of those is fantasies of extreme violence. You keep going back and forth between health and soil because they are connected. They are connected, it's right, yeah. What did, yeah. What did you say was one of the main connections between mass shootings and what? Uh, um, antidepressants and psychiatric drugs. Antidepressants, oh, yeah. one of the main side effects of them is fantasies of extreme violence. Yeah. Um, yeah my... and. And, and there is somebody, this was a while ago, this was before we had this huge new explosion, but about 10 years ago, someone um, did research and found that every single person who, um, every single shooter of the shootings that had happened up to that point was on an SSRI. So yes. I don't know if that and, has and, and I would assert that part of the reason why they were on that SSRI is comes from yeah. Barbara Stitt, who wrote the book, Food and Behavior, The Natural Connection who said that every single one of the serial killers and mass shooters she interviewed had one thing in common. And that was that they bragged that they lived on junk food. So they deprived their bodies of vitamins and minerals. They're eating GMOs and glyphosate and all kinds of junk food. And that led to depression, which then led to the SSRIs and the homicidal activity. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so, okay. Keep going. And we'll, we'll say say so how you. much of all of these things that we're worried about um, can be helped by this, this strange little <laughs> clump of dirt on my screen. Um, and what we're seeing here is, um, is actually not just dirt. It's not just the mineral portion of soils. This is soil that has been, that biology, soil biology and plants, et cetera, have turned into a sponge. And you can see the little threads, the mycelial network that's developing there between things. You can see how they're clumped into little clumps by the biological glues and slimes of, um, of bacteria and fungi. And, uh, and you can see this sacred space in between things. So important, this space. You know, it's not even, we, we often think it's things that do things, but it's also space that does something. And why is that space so important? And why is it so important that, that we have active biologically alive soils in order to make those spaces? And we'll that's what we're gonna take a few minutes to talk about right now. So I use this little video as a way of um, this demonstration. I'll often do it live if I'm at a dinner party or at a conference, um, but we can think of flour as like the, just the mineral portion of soils. 
And um, you can see that the flower, there's no sort of relationship between the little particles, right? And if we put this out in the wind or we blew on it, they would fly away, right? So, and that's what happens with unhealthy degraded soils that don't have a lot of biological activity, they will blow away in the wind. And that actually has lots of secondary effects uh, in terms of melting glaciers and things like that, um, where we don't, we don't have seasonal stream flow anymore. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do then is to take uh, a cup and make a rain cloud <laughs> and say, what happens when we rain on degraded soil or soil that is not living soil? And you will see that just like when you're baking bread, that water is running off the top and uh, it's creating flooding. It's yep. creating uh, landslides um, and it is taking a lot of the soil with it. And it's also taking any of those chemicals that are being used in the soil with it into the rivers and streams and lakes. And when you see if you fly across the country or you drive around, you'll see how many lakes and ponds are bright green and bright blue. And that has to do with some of that runoff. Um, and that, that those are also toxins that the, the um, blue green algae, the, the, uh, it is a type of blue green algae, but not the, not the good one. Uh, <laughs> um, the algal blooms that we're seeing. Uh, now, if you were to, if you were to put this plate out into the sun, these, this stuff on the top is gonna dry up and um, that creates a crust on the surface. And even right now, even before it's dried, if you were to lift up this, you know, if you've done baking, you know that there is, there's no water down in here, right? There's no water down in the soil for the plant roots if this was a landscape. Right. So, um, but if you put it out in the sun and this dries up, then it gets even harder. And the next time it rains, even less water is gonna soak into the soil. There's less infiltration happening, more flooding, and you can see here how flooding and drought are two sides of exactly the same issue. Now, a third thing that we worry about with climate change is what happens, uh, why do we have all these forest fires? Well, if you have a tree growing here and it falls over, does it have the fungal communities in the soil to, to turn it back into soil? No, it's just gonna dry up and become fuel lying on the ground. There's no moisture, there's no fungal activity there to break that tree back down again. So flooding, drought, wildfire, um, melting glaciers, a lot of this has to do with the soil being degraded. Okay, so what do you have to do to turn flour into bread? <laughs> You add biology, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we're baking bread, we, we make it's, it's yeast. In soils, it's also yeast, but lots of other things too. It's different fungal communities, different bio bacterial communities, it's plant roots, it's all kinds of biology. It's earthworms under the soil. It's everything that's living under there. And what's happened here is that these particles, like that slide we were looking at before, have been put together into little clumps. They've been tied, those little clumps have been tied together with little root hairs and fungal hyphae or like fungal roots. And suddenly we have that space that we saw in that previous slide. And so what happens when we have this structural integrity that it doesn't blow away if you were to blow on this, right? And it has also these holes, just like a kitchen sponge Kitchen sponge wouldn't be much good if every time you put it into water, it fell apart, or if every time you blew on it, it blew away. But it also wouldn't be much good if it didn't have holes in it. So what happens when we rain on this is something entirely different. That rain is soaking in, it's going down to the plant roots. If we didn't have a plate under there and there was 10 slices of bread or 100 slices of bread and it was deep soil, we keep going down, it's refilling the groundwater, it's refilling your well, it's coming, it's, it's, um, it's not breaking anything down, right? Um, it's there stored for the plants, stored for people, stored for uh, all of the underground life. And you'll see now that we've put like six, seven, eight times as much water as we have on the left, it is starting to seep out, but it is clean and clear. 
has gone through this huge carbon filter that is the ground. Uh, the biology in there also in real soils would have been breaking down some of those toxins through actual work. Um, and this water, of course, if this was a whole landscape, it wouldn't just be this little plate and this bread. This water is gonna seep out sideways into the lakes and the rivers and the ponds. It's gonna come out clean and clear and it's gonna be filling them up year round. So you don't get that big, huge, like after a rain, the river's like running really fast and it's all brown and dirty. It's just a nice long throughout the years flow to the rivers. Places that have figured out how to turn their soil from this degraded soil back into healthy soil are saying that their rivers are flowing more evenly throughout the year. They don't dry up. They are even getting longer. Um, places, some places in like Zimbabwe and Africa, uh, the rivers are starting a mile further upstream because the water is coming down through the soil and refilling those old river beds. So um, I like to say that the, the, the health of the soil can be determined by the structural and functional integrity of the soil. Now, this picture uh, on the right here is an, another, another way that with real soil, we can test this. And you can do this with like a little onion bag in a, in a cup. Um, you put a little rubber band around your onion bag, have two tall cups or vases or something like that, and take some soil from a place that is, has been growing under plants perennial, perennially, like for example, um, under a fence line where it doesn't, doesn't get mowed a lot, doesn't get disturbed a lot, doesn't get dug up. And then take some soil from a place that's rototilled and disturbed a lot and maybe has chemicals put in it or, um, or is bare a lot of the year. And you gently put some in this onion bag or you can do it with a screen, this is a screen. Um, you, and then you put some in this one. Mm -hmm. This one, if, if, it's, if it's got those biological slimes and glues and threads, uh, even if you leave it for hours, the water is gonna stay clean and clear because one of the amazing things is that the, um, just like egg white or mucus or that kind of thing, when biological slimes dry, they're very, very water resistant. And that's part of why it stays together. Um, if, it's, if it's degraded soil, it's going to fall apart almost instantly and turn the water brown. Wow. So, um, and like I said, it, you know, if, it, if, it's, if it has that structural integrity, it's gonna keep the soil particles intact even when the wind blows. So um, having those white snow fields and white glaciers is part of how our planet stays cool. Because just like wearing a white hat or a white t-shirt, it reflects the sunlight back out away from space and doesn't absorb it as heat. It also helps to keep um, that long, slow seasonal stream flow going down into valleys. Um, having that space underground also means that um, there is, it's easier for plant roots to grow and for these mycorrhizal fungi, which are not the ones that make mushrooms, they're the ones that connect plants to each other or help plants explore under the soil. So they're basically extensions of the plant roots and they will go out like, like a little intelligent um, seeker and find nutrients that are far away in exactly the right timing and ratio and amount that the plant needs for what the plant is facing right at that time. And of course, plants are living in the same environment that we are, especially if we eat things that are growing right around our houses, right? So mm -hmm. it's very relevant to what's going on with you because plants are also susceptible to fungal diseases and bacterial diseases and viruses, et cetera. So if the plants are growing in an undisturbed soil, a healthy soil, these mycorrhizal relationships, these, these fungi underground will go find for the plant the minerals that they need to have that, that uh, nutritional integrity that is what is needed to fight off the diseases of the moment. It's quite amazing. 
Yeah, I read um, in a uh, article or video in Hawaii that a man was talking to the the National Homeland Security uh, former director guy, and and he admitted that GMO crops were very dangerous because when a pest or a fungus would come, it would wipe out the entire crop. And yeah. normal crops don't get wiped out because the mycorrhizal in the soil talk to each other. And when the fungus or the pest is at one end of it, by the time it gets halfway through or, you know, like the rest of the plants have developed some sort of resistance to exactly. that. Exactly. They start fungus making or bacteria yes. and they, they don't die. So that's why the, the director of Homeland Security said, yes, GMOs are very dangerous for this reason because the entire crop will get wiped out. And the guy asked him, well, then well, why do we have them? And he said, well, because we have to convince our enemies to, to have them because control over the food supply is, oh. is a powerful thing. You know, he like, wow. yeah, he admitted love it. Love to see that article. I yeah. Love to see it's that. a video. It's, it's, a, it's on our website, okay. actually. It's a video. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, can... so part of what the plants are doing with what you were just describing is they're making volatile organic compounds, which could be, that, that includes a lot of things, right? That includes some of the things we worry about as toxins, but in the plant world, that's what makes the plant smell and taste. Mm -hmm. And those are that's what essential oils are made from, which we know have tremendous healing properties when used at the right time in the right place in the right amounts. Um, so, um, so, and that's how the plants can actually protect themselves against all of these things is that they make these very special compounds just right at the right time and in the right amount. So. So um, uh, I just want to say before I go further about this, the, the, the how-to of how to get this soil sponge to develop is um, to reduce or eliminate any soil disturbance. So that means learning how to grow food in a no-till, no-dig system. So you're doing like layering, layer gardens, or you're planting more like perennials, like uh, berry bushes, asparagus, things that um, fruit trees, et cetera, that that will, you know, that don't need to be dug up much. Um, and um, uh, and then also, so it's one thing is not disturbing the soil. Another thing is making sure that you have plants growing as much of the year as possible. So you don't leave the soil bare. Um, if you do have a stretch of time that it needs to be bare, it needs some sort of cover. So some sort of mulch, um, you know, straw or hay or um, wood chips or even just, um, you know, things, things from your kitchen like corn husks and things like that that aren't going to get stinky that you can put lay over the top. Um, um, that's very important for those uh, soil, that soil life to have that covering, that protection. Um, diversity is really key. So not just having like a green grassy long lawn with one type of grass um, um, and not just growing one type of vegetable in your garden. Um, and, uh, and then integrating animals, which in, in some cases might mean that you every now and then let the chickens run around there or it may mean that you plant lots of pollinator plants. And even that, even having insects and birds coming means that they're dropping, their droppings down, which is much more like a, what a wild landscape would be like. Um, and those are part of what feeds all of that underground life and, and brings interesting microbiomes from other places, right? So all of that, all of that is important for the soil life. Um, I'm gonna, there's some stuff I'm not gonna talk through here just because this could be a much longer presentation. I teach a five week course on this, which we'll put the link in in a minute. Yeah, um, just but I do want to show. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is eight o'clock, just in case you need to go. We, we booked you for um, half an hour. So, so it's okay, we can go later if you need to. Okay, I, um, I'm, yeah, I'm okay. But so I did want to just should talk about this slide here because this is Great. like that flower and bread slide, but it's actual soils and, um, you can see these are five like kind of cookie cutter pans of soil from the same farm, same soil type. But over here on the right, they have not been using any of those principles I just talked about. So it's heavily tilled. It's um, no, no plants growing on top, no mulch on top. They've been using lots of pesticides and fertilizers, et cetera. And as you go to the left, 
they're using more and more of those principles. So less disturbance, more perennials, uh, mulch on top, uh, more animals integrated and getting rid of fertilizers and pesticides, et cetera. Now look here at these jars in the back are catching the water that's flowing down through. And these ones in the front are catching the water that runs off because we've put like a shower head over this. Wow. And you can see on the far right, all the water has run off. Nothing's down there for the plant roots. If you flip this over, it is absolutely dry and dusty underneath. And you've lost a lot of soil and you've also polluted a lot of the water that's around you. Wow. Over here on the left, all the water has soaked in. It's clean and clear. Nothing has run off. Same soil type. You'll have, you know, if you go to a class on soil and gardening, they'll say, well, the water infiltration is dependent on the ratio of sand, silt, and clay. These all have the same ratio of sand, silt, and clay. So really, really great. We let our grass grow, and now the seep pond is like mm -hmm. a quarter of the size mm. because the grass and the pastures and fields and all around it have grown, and their roots have grown deeper, and now they're soaking up more rain. Yes. And so yeah, there's less there's less runoff going down into the sea. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So wow, this is, this there's a lot great. more to say about this. And I mean, I'll just say very briefly that having this soil sponge kickstarts uh, a, a healthy water cycle, as you're describing there too. Mm -hmm. That is part of it's a huge aspect of how our planet is supposed to stay cool. So and would we you have, recommend, would you recommend people just not mow in order to so, allow the, the um, I recommend to be leaving it quite long. You may want to mow it some because otherwise, I mean, depending on where you are, if I don't mow, it will literally turn back into woods in five years. So yep. because I'm surrounded by woods. Um, um, but what I do is to, is to let it grow quite long, long and then mow just sort of like once or twice at the end of the season or let the chickens do, do some mowing, et cetera. Right. Um, it, it really depends on what grasses you have growing and what else is growing there. But yes, in general, leaving things as long as possible. Let me just see. So, um, I can't find it. Let's see. Dung beetles. I love dung beetles. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, well, okay. So here we'll talk just about this. If we could have 25% more photosynthesis or more green plants, which could be more dense plants, right? So less bare ground, more diversity of leaf structures, more height of, you know, lawns, et cetera. Or, a, or just a longer green growing season that you don't dig things up so fast. If we had 25% more green on our farmland around the world, it would reverse the global warming we've already seen through plant transpiration, which is basically plants sweating. You know how you cool off when you sweat? Mm -hmm. The air around you also cools off when you sweat. That's how an air conditioner works, basically. You know, the air conditioner puts that water out out the window and the inside it gets cooler <laughs> so um so um and it's how like what we call swamp coolers work that kind of air conditioner too so so plants are transpiring water all the time when they're photosynthesizing when they're growing and that cools the air around them so much so that if we had 25 percent more green on our farms it would reverse the global warming we've already seen only and I bet now, I now lawns in the United States take up, I can't remember what percentage is, but it's very similar to the amount of land that we have in farmland. So those of you who are not on a farm, but are have a lawn, if we could get this happening on lawns, it would have a very similar effect. So I will, I will stop there. Well, um, Dee Dee, that, that picture with the field, I'm going to assume that if you were to dig down on this on the right hand side where there was really no grass growing. Th this one? Yeah. If you were, yeah. if you were to, the soil temperature would be much higher than it were be if you were to dig down over here. Absolutely. Too. Absolutely. So yes, and thank you for pointing that out there. So there is this is one way that having a healthy soil sponge or having healthy landscapes would cool the planet. There are about 10 other ways 
Another aspect is through carbon drawdown. There's a lot less atmospheric carbon. If, if the whole planet looked like this, that carbon is in the life here. Mm -hmm. So there's less, there's less in the air. But it's also like you, you were just saying, this, this hot bare soil is holding on to that heat. Just like in your city, right? In a city, it's going to be hot overnight. And I think 60% of our global warming is nighttime temperatures. That we're supposed to have clear, cloudy, clear, clear skies at night. Um, and the air, the hot is supposed to go back out to space. And instead we have um, hazy polluted skies, partly from blowing soils, partly from exhaust, et cetera. And, and we have landscapes that are absorbing heat during the day, which then radiates much more heat than this. It's not just like that this temperature is warmer than this. This is temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature. Because it radiates, Kelvin. it radiates it back into the heat, back into the air versus just, just like when you see a tarmac, a, a um, tar road, it radiates the heat back up. Yeah, think heat. about, think about you're walking barefoot on black pavement and there's a grassy lawn right next to you. Where do you go? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so can you, does anybody have any questions it, about, it's like, what are some things that we can do to improve our soil health? I mean, I'm thinking compost right away. You mentioned putting things on top of the soil, the your kitchen scraps, your mulch, things like that. Anything else that you didn't mention that you want to say to improve soil health? Well, I think the big, the biggest and most important too are to not till the soil. So don't, so we, oh, if we till it, it, it makes it nice and fluffy, but it, that's very temporary, but over time it actually, you know, if you put bread in a blender, it doesn't keep those holes, right? <laughs> yeah. It becomes a big mashy ball. So, um, so, so not tilling and the other is having green growing plants as much as possible because those plants are feeding the fungi and the microbes and all the, all the life underground that makes that spongy structure. So if you starve, if you starve it or you chop it up, um, it's it, it can't grow. That sponge can't grow. So those are the two big ones. All right. So and Frankie's compost is great Kickstarter. And okay. um, yeah. And if it is bare, if it has to be bare for some reason, then make sure that it has some mulch or something else around. So okay. we have we have a farmer with us who's on with us now, Mark Dudla. Um, great. He has a um, regenerative organic farm here in Wisconsin, and he has done a couple of calls with us where he's been teaching people how to uh, grow cover crops. And so, awesome. Yes. So we have several members who, and he's going to be making uh, crimpers for everybody, and we have oh, wow. members order them. And so, yeah, I mean, I've got my cereal rye growing. Yep. That's nature, fantastic. Na yeah, yeah, nature does not like bare soil. So That's right. That's right. So Fra Frankie asks that she's trying to help a new gardener in North Carolina. Gee, that sound, kind of sounds like me, who is <laughs> about two years, whose soil is all clay. How should she amend mm -hmm. her soil now in order to grow healthy crops in the summer? So, um, so high quality compost is useful. And also, um, you know, if there are, if you can get something growing now, um, that's useful. If you can't, then then cover it and just yeah, and stopping stopping tilling. There, occasionally with a clay soil, you may need to um, find someone who has something that will kind of poke down in and inject compost without okay. actually like rolling it all up. So um, okay. that that can help. And planting things like tillage radishes. I was gonna say daikon, daikon, like daikon. Yep. Um, that kind of thing that um, that will get way down in there and start and then it'll and leave it right don't try to pull it out just leave it let it decompose and that will leave this nice mushy hole um, that's feeding things and then it can kind of start working from there so that's great and Thomas you had a question I think we're going to have to wrap up by no question but a comment if you let me sure Hawaii is so backward. They do not allow compost piles on farms. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that and I thought about the reason why. And the reason why is what you said a minute ago about something smelly. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that works on an organic farm and Hawaii created a law that 
they were going to uh, put all the food waste from the islands in into the soil, into compost. And I know this is a little contradictory, but this farm, I guess, I guess you can have compost piles if you pay a whole bunch of fees and follow a whole bunch of regulations. But this farm, I go there quite often and I said, the compost isn't the problem. It's what going into the compost and the yes, problem. Right, if right. you have all the food waste from this island, which is a ton of toxic food, and you put that in the compost pile, you're going to have E. coli and bad smelly compost. Yeah. I yeah. told that to this young man. He quit doing that, and he said his compost pile became very sweet smelling. Yes. Yes, that's right. It should be sweet smelling. Yeah. That's fantastic. All right. Well, thank you I very much. Mark Mark has a hand up. Hi, Mark. Oh, Mark. Sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Hi, Dee Dee. This is Mark. Uh, Hi. And I'm making crimpers for moms across America. Just the That's foothold awesome. one. Uh, a number of these families planted crimp uh, cereal rye, um, you know, winter cereal rye. Yeah. Yeah. What suggestions? Um, you know, I'm going to make them aware to crimp after uh, pollinization and thesis happens. What suggestions do you have to them for garden applications of what they should put in their crimp cereal rye fields? Um, you know, I know that some squashes work well, live plants work well. Uh, they are doing the, what I'll call the holy grail, no-till organics. I know, it's amazing. That's wonderful. They're on, they're on their way. So if you could give them with suggestions and arm them with uh, what you think they should be doing, that would be really great. My suspicion is that you know better. I am more of a big systems person. How it gets applied in a local place is so specific. Um, and it really is partly like, what do you want to grow? But I think you said, you know, things that are going to help sort of spread out a little bit and hold that down and then keep keep it covered as that as that rye turns back into soil and protects the surface. Um, so thinking about things that will, can come up a little higher or can spread out, um, can have living leaves that are really capturing sunlight and getting it down. But also thinking about diversity is really is really key, right? That um, that's not just one thing. Um, I like the idea of planting the daikon radishes early in the spring, right? They grow very quickly. And then by the time you plant another crop, you, right, you've got some looseness going on in there underneath the, the um, crimper rye, right? You could mm -hmm. practically go in and replant right in those holes. Or, um, or planting them. The other thing is to plant them kind of, you know, later in the season so that they actually freeze and dissolve. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's, got I it. mean, it could go either way. They're also really good for you. So, you know, planning them so that you can actually eat some of them. Eat them. Yes. Radishes There's are really delicious. wonderful things people are doing of like, you know, planting a garden with like no rows, no, not just like a crazy garden. I forget what they call it. And you just go out and it's wonderful for children, children to go out and find things, you know, oh, I found a carrot. I found, you know, and then they're recognizing the tops of like, what does a radish look like? What does a carrot look like, right? It's beautiful. And speaking of that, um, Chris is asking if you have a class suitable for teens. Um, the class that I'm, that I, the online class that I am teaching starting on February 20th would be suitable for a teen if they are willing to participate in discussions. So an extroverted teen would really enjoy it. Um, um, and then- uh, Do they go to this site, Lolly? Yes, and if you scroll down there, you'll see of the courses um, that, um, let's see, oh, funny, it's not showing up. Hmm. Uh, let me let me get you the, let me get you the actual link to the course because it's not okay. showing up there. Okay, I'll and I'll include it tomorrow. Okay, um, and courses. the other thing is is that understanding soil health and watershed function um, is great for homeschools, for schools. It's being used in 60 different countries. Um, if you want to pull that up under the resources on that land and leadership page. Okay. Um, let's see here. Sorry. Um, you might you might want to try refreshing that page too to get that. Hmm. I know. I know that I um, I had just published it. It wasn't, and it wasn't quite showing up. So, 
sometimes teachable is a little funny. Um, would it be under resources list? Um, there, it would be under resources and it says soil health manual. Okay. Oh, I showed that earlier. When, yeah. 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 Soil, yes, I showed that earlier. That was that was the one that um, when, when you were it was distracting. Okay, wait, hang on a second. Let me get back to that. Um, great. Okay. And we had another question about a furrow with compost in it or moss or something like that. Would that would that help? Is one one of the questions she asked. Um, a furrow with compost, yes, I wouldn't. Moss is sort of a is um if moss is growing to begin with, it means it's the only thing that can grow. So what will grow, can, what can grow will grow is a really good principle. So, you know, don't be like, oh, I got to pull out all these weeds because that may be the only thing that can grow. So obviously if you're growing food, you do want to, you know, make space for it, but don't be too fast to say, oh, this is not native or this is a weed, et cetera. Um, because it, it's like, you can read those weeds Here's the course. Um, oh, sorry, it was compost, not not moss. Sorry, it was oh, okay. yeah. compost. Yeah. Either compost side. in a furrow can be really helpful uh, okay. if it's high quality um, compost. So compost that smells good, that um, is well, not, foraging, not anaerobic. Foraging that? is also foraging is a whole, a whole nother topic. That I mean, I Ooh, found so many important. things. So many things that people think are weeds are. So nutritious. So important. I know purslane that grows often like when you first, you know, first get a garden started. Plant, plantain. Fantastic for you. Plantain, dandelion. Yeah. Those are all liver. Lamb's, lamb's quarters. Lamb's quarters yeah. actually food. So somebody's yeah. asking about paramagnetic rock. I, I'm don't not sure. Know, what don't asking. know much about that. Don't know. Okay. Um, and um, let's see. Yeah. Phase two daikon radishes with rye in the fall. That's great for Mark Dudla. And um, a lot of great resources here that we've got tonight. Yeah, Hugo I really culture is really so much. Hugo culture is like laying out, laying out sticks and branches, and then putting soil over them, and then they get this amazing fungal communities because there's the fungal communities are already in the wood. So as they break down, you have a beautiful fungal soil underneath. It's really kind of a good. form of a raised bed. So great, really great. Great. Thanks for inviting me. Well, Thank you for um, coming, Dee Dee. I would love um, a few months down the road to have you on again because I have a feeling we've only scratched the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. Here with <laughs> us, and um, yeah. Well, I'm gonna. I will be including all of all of the um, links to um, Dee Dee's resources tomorrow. And this was fantastic. I'm so happy that you were I'm so excited to have come on because. Um, you know, I've been working with Will Allen, farmer Will Allen, and he's always saying it's all about the soil. So, I mean, he would yell at me if I'd say, I need to go get some more dirt. And he's like, it's soil. You can't call it dirt. <laughs> so I'm. Uh, and you need to make more, make more soil, not go buy it. We need to so make. More. At, yeah. So last night, last night I went and picked up my Azure order. And one of the first things I asked him when I got there with this at the semi truck was got any extra pallets? And he said, I, I, do, I sure do. And mm -hmm. so I brought home some more pallets. So I'm going to be building. I have three compost bins. I'm going to be building two more. Okay, okay. but a great That's suggestion good. from Joe Roberts that was on one of our, our Neighborhood Food Network call is to not put your compost like on over tree roots. Put your compost in your garden and make, make it so that you can move it around so that you are having all the good juices from your compost go right into a garden bed, right? Instead mm -hmm. of what I did, the mistake was I put the compost under a tree up by the side of the garden. So the tree is getting all the good juices. I mean, that's very nice, but mm -hmm. we're not eating the tree. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. but we do take the leaves from the tree. It's a maple tree and we use that on the garden. So in a way it is kind of, you know, it's all yeah. coming. Up. And, and I, I'm seeing from Annie here, just be very wary. There are a lot of garbage companies that are selling like compost or soil. No. A lot of that is really don't do that. nasty stuff. So, yeah, yeah, our yeah, our people don't do that. Milwaukee, yeah, Milwaukee sells malorganite, and we I'm always advising people not to. Do you get do you get that up by you, Mark? He he's muted. And then we need to ask you about fulvic in the soil. Yeah, we don't uh, use that, but yes, it is here. Okay. So so yeah, I guess last question, Didi. Can you tell us a little bit? People are asking about fulvic acid in the soil. So 
uh, Elaine Ingham is the, was more of a person to learn from of that kind of thing. And, and my course is actually um, runs in conjunction with the Soil Food Web School. So if you really want to delve into that, I would consider listening to some lectures by Elaine Ingham. We don't necessarily have to sign up for the whole expensive course, but there's a lot online. Um, um, but if you really want to get into the it's a great course. And putting a um, link to her website, the Soil yeah. Food Web. And people who sign up for her whole course get my course for free. So that so that's how we collaborate on that. But um, um, but I will I will just say that if you're if you're doing things, you know, if you're if you're following the principles, the system knows how to make balance. The same, it's very much true in our bodies, right? If we feed ourselves the right foods. Um, we go to bed on time, you know, we don't it, spend too much time on devices, et cetera. Our body's going to figure it out. And the soil and plants are like that too. So don't worry, do I, you know, is it going to be the wrong fungi? If you're doing it right, it won't be the wrong fungi. You know, that, that's the amazing thing. We don't whatever have to shows figure, up. We don't have whatever to know. Shows up is, yeah, whatever shows up is what's needed, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so oftentimes I just let the weeds grow. And that's when I found, got a beautiful bush of lamb's quarter, which tastes just like spinach. Yeah. You know, I want to see what weeds are growing. I want to know what's going on with my soil. And as long as it's not totally crowding out the, you know, the crop that I have, it's, I don't mind a, a few weeds growing around it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, food for other things too. Often it's very, you know, those weeds are food for the beneficial wasps and all of that. So. Okay, so I want to share um, for next week. Thank you very much, Dee. Everybody Thank go to her website, so check much. it out, sign up for her courses. I don't think we've ever had a guest with so many courses that you have uh, <laughs> on your website. So really just, you know, a, a wealth and of knowledge. Thank you, I Anne. Will say this, group, this group would love the book, The Ecology of Care. Usually I don't even push the book, but you guys, you guys are on it. So Okay. <laughs> okay. All, all your stuff in there. So. Awesome. All right. So, so I want to share just two things before we go close the call folks next week, I'm going to be talking about scalar energy and frequency healing. And uh, yes. And so um, I've also, I'm reading this book, the body electric, I'm not done with it, but this book highly recommends this is healing with voltage by um, John Tennant, um, Jerry Tennant, sorry, Jerry Tennant. This guy really recommends this book. So I'm working on this now. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about a new product that we're going to have available that involves frequency healing so um, that people can and get, we have special guests that are going to be coming on from that. So next week, I don't think I'm going to be able to get Jerry Tennant, but I can talk about it and I can, you know, we can, we're going to be talking about the EE systems um, that are happening all across the country. If you go to unified healing, um, maybe I can get a guest for that unified healing Um Dot com, you can find these different EE systems and you can see testimonials there. So we'll be going over that. And then also, um, sorry, Jamie, that's entering now. We're going to be going. Okay. Um, one more thing is um, I'm going to be starting a new business and I'm going to um, be segueing a little bit more out of um, some daily duties at Moms Across America. So I'm looking for somebody who wants to be like a nonprofit manager to help with the daily activities. I will still be, you know, a spokesperson and speaking and, you know, all that kind of stuff for Moms Across America. But if you can think of anybody that's helped run a nonprofit before, or at least done project management, um, it will eventually be paid position. So just, I'm just putting a bee in the bonnet of some of my favorite people that I see every Monday, you know, cause I want the person to be referred to us or to know, I'd love it if it was one of you, because you know how we communicate, you know, how we use empowering language, you know, how um, you know, uh, the types of resources and things that we offer. So um, just everybody put that be in your bonnet of a good person to help run Moms Across America. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We'll wait, see you later. Wait, 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 wait. What? what? I, want, I want to show everybody the new website. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, wait, I have it. Yes, I'm going okay. to show. Yes, I have it. I look, guys, and spent, I don't know, probably two weeks redoing the neighborhood food network website it is so beautiful take a look at this it's got video going the whole time and we've got all of our um you know our mission on here and everything that we're up to the benefits the neighborhood food network the garden song we love creative people and we've got all of our flyers and brochures um, our blog needs some help if you guys you know we need more activity on the blog if you guys want to write articles or help us find guests you know, guest bloggers, that would be great. 
We've got the crimping tool request here under resources, videos, the products we love. We could definitely add more products here too. And um, things like, let's see, in the planning, um, where, where's the planning one? Let's see, the one with the- under resources. It's under resources, okay. Um, Wait. Maybe I can't see it because my thing is down here. Over here, monthly planning reminders by zone. If you guys haven't done this, I think this is one of my favorite things on the website. Um, you can click on your zone and choose your preferred calendar, Google or Outlook, and it will tell you on the first day of the month what you should be doing, what kind of what kind of plant you know seedlings you could be starting, or what kind of uh, starts you could be transferring to your garden. And um, so, see, you just click on it right here, and then it adds to it every month on the first day. It will show up. So it will remind you to, hey, it's time to you know, plant those seeds and things like that. So we've got curing, canning, dehydrating, fermenting, and freezing, and just all kinds of good tips. So thank you, Anne, for doing such a great job on the website. Appreciate it. So beautiful. You really did a fantastic job. I was just on there before oh, the whole Thank you. It was a labor of love. Yeah. Wonderful. It's, Anne was, she was just meant to do this. You know, this is really mm -hmm. her baby. So we're so happy that um, she pulled that together. Anybody wants to contribute? I um, would love to, to do, I would love to have some stories to put on the blog of people, how they, how, you know, how they started their gardens and yes. Yeah. And, and because that's so empowering for other people, especially, you know, like my backyard, it was just all lawn and now it's my happy place. And People it's have growing, people growing have so created created so much beauty out of nothing, and I love to have love stories like that. Yeah, I've, and like I put Eileen, a couple books in the chat that I think would be great to refer to. There, there's one called Food Not Lawns, and another I think called Backyard Chickens. Perfect. Well, oh, that's my goal this year. In fact, I have a deck in my backyard. I'm going to take all. I told Zen I I had an epiphany. I don't use this deck. It's too small. It's kind of worthless. I'm taking it apart screw by screw i'm taking all that wood i'm building myself a chicken coop mm. so great great well thank you all for being on the call tonight it was so fun and yeah we can't wait to see you have chickens Anne. that's gonna be fun mm -hmm. <laughs> you're gonna be a chicken lady i know it you're gonna be telling the stories every, every week about your chickens all right thank you everyone maya thank you so much for, and you stayed on you didn't have to do that that was very lovely of you to go through and answer every single question that people had yes she but was a busy was girl Yes, we really so appreciate yes, it. So I will be sending out an e-blast tomorrow with all the links to all this stuff. So if you felt like you missed something, I will include all of it. That's why. So and you can also click on the three buttons below the chat. There's three little dots and you can click on that and say save chat. So if you want to go back and see a book that Dee, Dee recommended or anybody else. Um, and yes, we will bring it next week. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll see you on the Moms Connect call and the Neighborhood Food Network call next week. Good night, everybody. everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you so much.